Tonight we're in Bolton in Lancashire where we've been watching David Cameron and Ed Miliband in the first set piece of this election campaign. So welcome to Question Time. And good evening whether you're listening or watching on television or indeed here in our audience and on our panel a big welcome to the Conservative Education Secretary, Nicky Morgan, to the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Jim Murphy, to UKIP's finance and immigration spokesman, Stephen Wolfe, to the leader of the Welsh nationalist Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood, and to the broadcaster and columnist for The Independent, Janet Street Porter. And as ever, join in the debate by text or Twitter. They're both at your service. Our hashtag, remember, BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to 83981 and push the red button to see what others are saying. Uh, our first question from James Marshall. Do the television debates have any real political merit or are they just the result of our culture of personality? What do you think? <laughs> Yourself? A bit of both, really. Entertainment-wise, I really like watching them, but at the same time, are we voting for just that person or the entire party? Did you learn anything from, from listening to the two party leaders? I like Miliband more than I thought I would. But uh, other than that, I'm not really swayed either way. Well, well yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it slightly depends what you thought, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, how much more than you thought you would? Not that much. Oh, not that much. <laughs> Anybody else watch the debate? What do you think? Yes, the woman here. There were parts of it which were incredibly funny. Um, in any other circumstance, that might have been funny. However, we're talking about really serious issues and everyone was in stitches. I don't really think it's appropriate. Maybe that's quite po-faced of me, but... So it wasn't serious enough for you? Or did no. it deal with the issues seriously? No, I mean, there was so much laughter um, talking about things like immigration. It's not a funny matter. It's really serious. And I don't think people, because of these types of debates, take it seriously enough. Okay. It's not taken seriously enough. You in the second row from the back, yes. Uh, yeah. And um, I thought it was a bit of a case of style over substance. And I agree with the gentleman over there. I felt like I didn't learn anything, but I found David Cameron's inability to answer any questions extremely frustrating. <laughs> So, do, do you learn about the character of the two contenders for uh, the Premiership? For and do you get I'm an idea from watching them being interviewed and in front of an audience what their characters are? For me, I, I agree with the gentleman over there. I'm not a Labour voter or a Conservative voter, but I felt that um, Ed Miliband came across really well. He seemed relaxed. He, I, I liked his, what he was talking about, being a strong leader. And yeah, I thought he came across really well, better than I'd ever seen him come across in anything before. OK, and you, sir, on the front here. Uh, Paxo asked Mr Miliband if uh, Jim Murphy intended to spend all the mansion tax in Scotland. I'd just like to ask him if that was the case. Oh, yes. Jim Murphy, are you going to spend all the mansion tax if the Labour Party gets in on nurses in Scotland? No, which not, was part of the debate. You heard course, it. Not all. Just not a brief all, Not all of it, of course. Oh, not all of it? No. Uh, how much? The, the fact is... What how much? I wonder if I, I'll, I'll answer your question. Yeah, well, I'll answer mine and his at the same time. <laughs> it, what happens is the mansion tax is on properties over £2 million across the United Kingdom. And most of those properties happen to be in London and the South East, and it's part about sharing resources across the UK, from those who are more prosperous to those who need support. And we can't really have a world, surely, where we keep the wealth in some of our great wealth-generating cities alone. For example, in Aberdeen, the oil and gas industry has been a remarkable boost to the UK economy. But I wonder, do you want me to pick up on the debate? I want you to ask, just answer his point, and then we go answer, on about the general debate. The, the, the answer is about £125 million in terms of the, the money that's raised. But you have no... no I mean, you obviously slightly object to this, do you? Of course I do. Yeah, why, why do I you mean, object? Three months ago... <coughs> excuse me, three months ago, 40% of you said you didn't want to be part of us. So why should I be spending so my what's money... What's your 40, name, 45%. Philip, Philip, Philip McDermott. Philip. Off, Philip. <laughs> 40% of your nation said you no longer wanted to be part of us. Why should we be giving you extra resources? But Phil, the way it works is, you're right, 44-odd percent voted for independence and the majority voted to stay part of the okay. United Kingdom. You're using we, Ed Miliband's trick of asking him his first name. <laughs> well, I, think, I think it's rude not to ask someone's oh, right. name. You're having okay, a we'll conversation, never get you're having a conversation with you. I agree with Jim. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's across the UK, okay. sure, surely now that we've decided to stick together, we should share resources, right. north and south, east and west. Let's come to the question again. Thank you. 
I, I will bring more of you in when I can, the, but the question was whether the debates have any real political merit or just the result of a cult or culture of personality. Janet Street Porter. I don't think they have any real merit because if you look, imagine back to the last election how gorgeously attractive Nick Clegg was and how his ratings went up uh, <laughs> overnight because he was a very good television performer and there's a really big difference between being a television performer and a politician. On that basis, I'd be running, I'd be sitting in Downing Street, wouldn't I? <laughs> but I'm not. She wants the flattery to... No, no, I don't want to. Do you know what? I'm my ego's, even my ego's not that big. But I looked at this debate tonight and I just thought that it didn't tell you an awful lot about anything. It was a lot of flim-flam. And they all seem to not have taken on board that business of talking to the electorate in a language that they understand. And um, Ed Miliband, in particular, talked about the consequentials of tax. What the hell is a consequential when, it, when it's at home? And then when he was talking about energy bills, he talked about the upward pressure on bills. Like... Doesn't it just mean you'll be paying more? So what is it about politicians that when they go on television in an event like this, they can't talk normally? And I still counted how many times the hard-working family, like, tell me a family that doesn't work hard. Mm. They just spout clichés. They just can't stop themselves. OK. <laughs> yes, you. Do you agree with her? Um, yeah, yeah, man in the front, yeah. Yeah, uh, I do a bit, but... I was more focusing on Ed Miliband, and I, I just thought that him, like his character, was seen like he was getting bullied a bit more than David Cameron, and we were focusing more on his personality and that he's not going to be a good leader. Do you think that was fair or unfair? That I thought it was, very, it was very unfair on him. And what was I your thought. judgment of him? Um, <laughs> well, he came across like as a better like leader okay. uh, in the debate, but. He was still getting bullied for, like, just the way he is, like, for his Nick, personality. Nicky Morgan, you watched it all. What did you make of the two leaders? How do you compare Cameron and Miliband? <laughs> I thought you were going to forget his name for a moment there. I was going to say Clegg for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I was just waiting, I was just waiting to see. Um, I mean, just to go back to the, uh, the first question, Look, I think that the, yeah. uh, the debates have, um, they have some merit, and I think if they get people engaged in politics, and that's what we all want to see, we've got six weeks now of uh, a full-time uh, campaign, um, I think, to go back to the gentleman's question here, and I, I do think that actually people do want to know uh, what the two men are, are like, what makes them tick, what makes them want the job, but the point is that the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has been doing the job for five years. And so he has made those difficult decisions and then he is made a strong case for why those decisions be made. And Janet talked about language and I think that's a, that's a very uh, good point, something for all of us to remember. And um, I think the consequentials that she's talking about, the consequential is that Ed Miliband couldn't answer the question about where the money is going to come mm. from. And it's going to come from people's pockets. Uh, and that's what he didn't say. He can answer question one, but he couldn't answer questions two and three. And, you're, and your leader, you say he's been doing the job five, doesn't, doesn't want to go on doing it more than another... Well, it's not clear how long. He says until the next election, maybe a bit before. What? So he can't be that committed to it, can he? Uh, no, the Prime Minister is absolutely committed to it. I mean, he's seeking uh, election, uh, the whole team's seeking Surely election. Surely Mrs Thatcher five. was committed. I go on and on and on until I get kicked out. No, I think the Prime Minister's... <laughs> I think the Prime Minister is right, which is actually, he, he, he was asked a question, he gave a very straight answer. I don't think people do want politicians to go on and on and well, on. How long are you going on for? Well, I love my job, I'd like to have it as long as somebody <laughs> likes to be in it. OK, the woman in red there on the right, with spectacles. Yes. That's you. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it struck me that when David Cameron was questioned mm -hmm. and, and interviewed, that he avoided some real issues for real people, especially in terms of poverty and struggles and stresses in life that people have mm -hmm. in terms of the quality of life. And it strikes me that politicians would do well to focus more on a quality of life issue for all rather than profiting mm -hmm. and profiteering and capitalism, really. Mm -hmm. okay. Jim, Jim, Jim Murphy. Actually, perhaps you've had a bit of a sound. Come back to you. Leon Wood first. Then. Of course. I think it showed for me that the Prime Minister is not really used to being scrutinised properly, and we saw that today, and that was quite uh, interesting. Um, there was no acknowledgement from the Prime Minister of the difficulties that people are facing as a result of the politics of austerity. He was in denial about the question of zero-hours contracts, uh, no concern about the 
increased numbers of people using food banks. Where I come from, Wales, 79,000 people use food banks. Here in the northwest of England, 87,000 people use food banks. That is absolutely scandalous. And there was no acknowledgement of his role in any of that. Why do you say he was in denial? Just go back. Why do you say he was in denial about Zero Hours contract? He said that they'd, he'd stopped them being exclusive, didn't he? Well, he, he tried he, he to claim... He dealt with the issue, didn't he? He tried to claim that people wanted Zero Hours contracts. Now, I accept some people may, some students may uh, want Zero Hours contracts, but the vast majority, the 700,000 people who were on Zero Hours contracts, are forced onto them. Hasn't there always and been casual labour in this country? I mean, is it, it's called zero hours now, but there's always been casual labour of that There were zero hours contracts under the last Labour government, mm. but there weren't as many as there are uh, now. And I think the point that um, Miliband made about accepting the, um, that they were wrong on the regulation of the banks uh, is an important point as well, which is why I fail to understand why he continues to support the politics of austerity and is con committed to a further £30 billion worth of cuts which will cause even more misery to people. Surely, if he accepts that the uh, lack of regulation of the banks was a problem, then he should make sure that the banks and the bankers pay for the, uh, for the cuts and not the poorest people. Okay. And, and yes, you with the hand there. Yes. Hi, um, I'm on a zero hours contract and it's not what I want. And they were supposed to be just temporary. Um, but the, David Cameron said that he um, stopped it so that you can, you, um, that it's exclusive to that particular employer. It can't but, be exclusive, is what he said. Yes. But, my, but my employer has said that this job has to be my priority if I get a That's second right. job or if I go back, you know, if I decide to go back to study. And it's just, it's not working. It's Can not you just tell enough. us a bit more about the job and what, 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 what the nature of the zero hours is and how many hours you get? Completely varies week to week. Um, the, the nature of the job, I get a few more hours in school holidays, but I could, I could get 12 hours or I could get 25. It, I just don't know week to week and my rota only goes up week to week. And I what kind of work is it? What is it you're doing? I work in a cinema. Right. And, and, uh, and it, it, how long does the contract run? A um, year or...? It's rolling. Just keep, it just keeps rolling along. OK. Well, you're the finance expert for UKIP, Steve Wolf. What do you make of that, of the zero hours contract? For or against? Well, we, we've actually stated that zero hours contracts were a, a construct that came from EU directives that related to temporary workers' directives. And as soon as that came in, you saw a rise in terms of the numbers of uh, zero hours contracts. And we're opposed to that because we think that whilst there is some merit, as you say, for some people who want to do zero hours contracts that could be the students. The principle of making sure that people work for virtually nothing or without security is wrong. And it shouldn't be applied in this country, not in a day and age where there are jobs out there. And this lie brings a lie to the fact that we've had growth in this country just because we say we've got lots more people in employment. We have got lots more people in, in employment but they're on low, low wages, they're in part-time jobs, and they're in zero-hours contracts. Yes, it is. And, and the people... Well, uh, sorry, are you saying, are you saying that the, 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 the growth that's reported is phony, in effect? Well, what we're saying is that, that in relation to the amounts of jobs that are out there, these are people who are earning less than, than they were in, in previous years. When people are going asking for work, they're seeing that the minimum wage now is effectively the maximum wage for them and people are having to find it incredibly difficult to survive so they're going to try and find more than one job and that's what puts pressures on families it makes sure that the difficulty when they're getting home they ha can't educate their kids, children as you're talking about if they're always having to work I know it's a difficult situation but the government has to put themselves at blame for this by not putting in place a, a way that we deal with the supply okay. and demand of labour in this country. Who, who Can I deal with the debate Who, who impressed you at most well, in the I, debate? Well, actually, neither of them really impressed me because I We're don't not think... talking about Paxman and No, 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 no because, because, we're because, talking about... No, because uh, it, wasn't really, it wasn't really like a... De it wasn't a debate, actually, it was. It was, it was like two boxers fighting in two separate rings with one referee. And, and the point about it is... What, what, shadow boxing? Well, you could say it was shadow boxing to go with the shadow banking that they hid under the, under the Labour government. But what, what I found that was more interesting about it is what we didn't learn from the two men on this particular occasion. What we didn't learn was actually how Mr Miliband was actually, if he wanted, came into government, was actually going to increase taxes 
or what the cuts he was going to make. He talked about having fair taxes and talked about spending cuts, but he didn't give us a clue. Okay, he I've, didn't have an idea what was the I've number got, of people got, was in the country. I've got a question stacked up from the audience on that. Let me just bring okay, in sure. Jim Murphy on the general, because I brought you in very early in answer to... Mm -hmm. Do you remember his name? Of course. What was his name? Phil. What? Phil. Phil. <laughs> right. In reply to Phil. There you are. Is that right, Phil? That's yeah, actually going to be the that, hardest question of the name. <laughs> that's the hardest question of the name. Can you remember What's the name? What's Phil's name? Right. Yes, I can't. <laughs> I can't name everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> but to come to James's point from the beginning. Uh, look, the look, overall uh, debate, and then we go on to a specific yeah, question look, about money. I think someone asked, um, will it change the election? And the truth is, we don't yet know. But what did we learn tonight? We learned, I think, tonight why David Cameron didn't want to have a proper debate. I mean, it was... <laughs> it is... Look, you expect a Prime Minister to defend his record, that's what he's there for. But that's all he did. I mean, he genuinely couldn't tell us why we should vote for him the next time round. It was all about what's happened over the past five years and almost nothing about what will happen over the next five. And you know, for me, the most revealing moments were right at the beginning, when Jeremy Paxman asked him, how many food banks? How many people on zero hours contracts? The truth is that the government doesn't even count how many people are using food banks. I asked questions in the House of Commons last week. They don't even count how many families use food banks. Now, is that true? Well, let her just answer. You made the point. Do you, do you know how many people use food banks? No, but the DWP, no. do, well, DWP uh, well, I, uh, no, uh, D, the Department of Work and Pensions and Ian they absolutely they do uh, know that information. But Jim, no, I'm Nicky, sorry. Nicky, hold, on, Nicky, hold on a second, and I'll finish this answer. I asked a question to the, the Minister for Work last week in the House of Commons, and I've got it in writing, I'll put it on my Twitter account later on this evening, and she said, we do not count the number of people who use food banks. So where does, figure, where, does the the where does the figure, where does the figure, where does the figure, 930, okay. these figures, come these, from, nearly these, a million, where does that come from? These figures come from the food bank charities themselves, the things like people, organisations such as the Trussell Trust. Do you know, you can't have a world, surely, where people who want to go out to work, they set the alarm clock, they go out to work, they get their kids to school, they sometimes on zero hours contracts, and people who are in work have to rely on charity to feed their children in a country as rich as ours, and you know, David Cameron seemed. <laughs> it wasn't just. To me, it wasn't just that he didn't know the number. He didn't seem to care. He didn't have a plan. Now, All right. I'm, I'm not sorry, saying that sorry. everything's going to be perfect if Labour wins the election, but we're going to sure as hell try. But to not have a world where don't people don't have to rely... Hold on, we don't have to Stop telling everybody else to hold on. You've had a, you've had a good say, Jim. Jim. Jim I'm okay. sorry. I'm Very briefly, because I want to go on to a substantial question from our audience. I'm Just a, a brief I'm response, if you would. The Prime Minister, absolutely, he does care. He showed that in the first answers about both uh, issues. But the important thing, he absolutely... The Conservative Party has a very clear plan what we want to do in the next five years and that is continue to sort out the economy because without a strong economy you can't pay for anything else at all and in terms of a plan for helping people out of poverty work is the best way out of poverty all right, and that's we'll... been shown over the course and for Stephen 1.9 million jobs have been created since 2010 78 percent of them have been full-time we've got more people paying uh, taxes uh, now at a higher rate particularly more women uh, and so actually again that puts but a compare put, the rate compare the rates you're, of you're wrong. all right well, wait a minute wait a minute we're going to go to the economy so let's do that just before we do uh, for those of you who'd like to take part in the question times that come up to the general election, we're going to be in Salford next week, and the week after that we're going to be in Bristol. Now, the address is on the screen there, uh, if you'd like to come. So I'm going to take a question uh, from Tina Gandhi, please. OK. Given that both major parties have ruled out increases in VAT and national insurance, does this mean that spending plans will have to be paid for by even greater cuts in welfare? Given major parties have ruled out increases in VAT and national insurance happened just yesterday, does this mean that spending plans will have to be paid for by greater cuts in welfare? Jim Murphy, but not at great length, if you would. Just a, a, a quickish answer no. to that. No. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll come to so, uh, how, how, how will it be paid for. That is a short answer. answer. And, and don't spoil it. Stick with it. Uh, um, Janet Street Porter. Well, um, the Prime Minister said tonight that the, the, well, the Tories proposed to reduce the benefit cap from 26,000 to 23,000. So there's your answer for starters, that 
Uh, the Tory party has already said that. Um, I think that cuts in welfare, in spite of what the people in the audience might think tonight, uh, play well with the electorate as a whole. So if I, I mean, I don't have an opinion one way or the other about cuts in welfare. I think there's been a lot, uh, benefit fraud has been over-exaggerated by the media and by television programmes and so on. The number of people who make fraudulent uh, benefit claims is relatively small. But if I was a politician seeking re-election, I've got to be honest, if I go out on the doorstep and say we're going to cut benefits, that generally plays, it would play well with most voters. So, as a cynic, I'd say benefits, uh, saying you're going to cut benefits won't lose you any votes. OK. Tina Gandhi, do you agree with that? Do you think that's what's going to happen? I think we're in a difficult position. I work for the 10 Greater Manchester local authorities. What I'm seeing on a daily basis is cuts amongst the local authorities having a direct impact on people and also... Um, seeing that the rise in fuel poverty, food poverty, as we we're talking about food banks, these cuts in welfare are going to have a direct impact on people's lives. People are struggling to pay for food, heating. More cuts is just going to make their situation worse. So would you like to see um, either the Tories increase VAT or Labour increase national insurance, both of which they've said they won't do? I think there are other solutions. So earlier there was talk about making the utility companies, the energy companies, um, you know, answer to the fact they're not actually meeting their energy company obligations. There's not enough pressure being put on the utility companies. I think that needs to be revisited. To, to, reduce, to reduce prices? Not just to re reduce prices, but, for example, all the energy companies have an obligation to h assist the fuel poor. But what, right, yeah. what they're doing is it. they're not actually doing that. They're reducing the amount that they actually help the fuel poor. And, and we're seeing, as a result, the um, percentage of fuel poverty increase nat uh, nationally. And excess winter deaths are also increasing. OK. Leon, Leon Wood, um, you, you're here as a, as, as a member of Plaid Cymru, but also you represent nationalists as a whole in Britain, so the SNP as well. And uh, everybody says the SNP, if Labour doesn't, you know, become, comes first, but not enough to form a government, will be there in government. So what you say about this is very important, because you and Alex Salmon are like this, aren't you, on the future of this uh, United Kingdom. Yes? You're beaming with pleasure, because <laughs> you only have three MPs, is it, at the moment? And so it's rather a tall order to say that you'll be in that position. But, I mean, he might have 40, and that'd make you 43, so it'd be quite powerful. So, what's your answer to the question? <laughs> well, there's every chance that there could be a hung parliament after this election, and so the smaller parties could well hold the balance of power. And we've said that this is a good opportunity to end austerity. The austerity experiment has failed. The, uh, the reasons that austerity was, was started was in order to cut the debt. And uh, they told us that the deficit would be eliminated within this parliament, and it hasn't been. So I wonder why have we had to put up with all of this pain when we've seen no gain? And we're told as well that the worst of the cuts are yet to come. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies says that the next round of cuts, 2%, just 2% will come from taxation and 98% will come from cuts to public services. My view is that public services have been cut to the bone. Our health and education systems can take no more cuts. And uh, it's time now for investment. But hang on, in the debate, he, uh, Cameron said that health and education are ring-fenced. Well, they may hang well on be a minute. in England. He said that. I'm not saying that I support David Cameron, but you've actually just misquoted him. They may well be uh, in England, but health and education are devolved in Wales and Scotland, yeah, and but those in... budgets haven't been protected in, in my country. Well, then that's, that's up to your Assembly. Well, the Assembly budget has been cut by... The Assembly budget has been cut by 10% and it's run by a Labour government and of course I would say that it could be run better and if it was run by Plaid Cymru it would be uh, run better. Okay. But there is this question of austerity and who is paying the price for it. There are other cuts but that could on. be But hang on, in the made. last happiness survey, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but you keep going on about austerity and misery, but the fact of the matter is that the government has, for whatever reason, I don't necessarily agree with it, conducted this happiness index, and it's gone on throughout, you know, the last two times the government. 
They have, the last term of the government, and they have asked members of the public, how do you feel about life in general? And guess what? Most people in Britain, whether you like it or not, feel quite happy with their lot. So how do you square that? <coughs> a lot of hands have gone up. And all I don't know whether the hands that's are happy not, hands or unhappy hands. That's not reported to me. That, Let, all right. That's not Let, what people say to me. All right. Uh, Steve, Steve Wolf. Well, I think it was absolutely clear in the debates that both Cameron and Miliband said that they would make cuts. But as I said in the previous answer, they didn't actually define where those cuts were going to be. And what we in UKIP have said is that there are ways of making savings, and we've estimated in the first years over 20 billion, edging up towards 30 billion, by looking at projects which are not necessary for the improvement of the welfare of this country. And also, under a fundamental belief, that whilst we're a good giving nation, we should actually be looking after our own. So we identified that the HS2 uh, scheme should actually go, and that would save us three billion a year. Whilst we believe that we should have targeted aid, we believe that we should be cutting at least nine billion from the foreign aid bill to actually look after the people in this country. And so the Welsh and Scottish budgets as well are going to take a hit from you, yeah? Well, we haven't suggested that we do that. Yes, what, we, what, we would, what, what we've actually from, said is that what we would look at is the Barnet formula because mm. we do believe that the, it, the, those people in England are actually having a raw deal in that there's £1,400 more a year being paid over to Scotland. And if you are actually going to, in terms of the, join in with the SNP and put the hands up at the back of the Labour Party and be controlling them like a little puppet behind, we want to make sure that we're the ones who are ha having to have some of our funding back when we're paying so much money out there. Because when I'm knocking on the doors in the constituents in Stockport, which I'm standing for, there are people really suffering. And they do want to know that they get a fair share out of this. And actually, over the years, they do feel that Scotland and Wales have had more of a fair share for quite okay. some well, time. Jim, Jim Murphy has said that Barnett... <laughs> let's, let's stop calling it the Barnet formula. Let's just say there's more okay. spending per head on people in Scotland than on people in England. Okay. You've said that. What do you make of what he says? Is he right that it's an unfair deal? Well, it's not. It's 1,200, not 14. But apart okay. from that, the principle is that, of course, the Barnet formula is how we share resources across the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, the, the, the regions of England. It's a, it's a time-honoured um, formula. It might be time-honoured, but you haven't said whether you agree with it or not. I, of course I agree with it. And as far as I understand... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. You, you, you mustn't mislead people. There isn't a formula for Cornwall. There isn't a formula for the North West. It's you don't have a formula here, do you, for how much money you get from the UK? The, the, but it's Scotland the Wales, does have a formula. And, and, That's the, Wel the, right. and the Welsh and the Northern yes, Irish do as well. Exactly. The, it's the money, and it's why the, is it fair and not fair for the people of Bolton to have a formula? Well, the way, the way it works, so you want to go back to the argument as to why the Barnet formula was introduced in the first place, then I'll maybe say a word or two about the debate. But as I understand that Labour, Tory and Lib Dems are all committed to maintaining um, the Barnet formula. It's, look, those of you who are from Bolton, can, I understand the argument. Um, but it does cost more. Look at the geography of, of Scotland. Look at the geography of the United Kingdom. You have much more rural communities in Scotland. It's often more difficult to provide public services in those island and rural communities. Look at the landmass of the United Kingdom. It's much more difficult and sometimes more expensive to run a national health service in some of those rural communities. That's the reasons why, part of the reasons why it was established at the beginning. It's part of the reasons why all three of the main parties will retain it. But to come to the point, the point that was asked... Um, at the be beginning from Tina. What cuts when, are you going to make, oh, is the question, oh, yes. £250 million on police budgets because we'll get rid of the commissioners, which are co a costly experiment. £200 million okay. on housing benefit. £400 million on the capping child benefit. £60 million on how we change the MOD. And we wouldn't have went ahead with a £3 billion tax cut for the richest 1% in the country. So there's a long list of things that we would change. But, 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 but no, don't exactly me right. to wait <laughs> one set. Okay. I've got to chair this Sorry, so that we right. get through it all. Thank you. <laughs> but, you can come, you can come in again. No, you've had, okay. you've had, you were very good at the beginning. You just I gave was. a one-word answer. I don't expect you to give one-word answers, but I think you've had your share for the moment. Okay. No problem. N Nicky Morgan. Well, I think what hasn't come up so far in this um, debate, stemming from Tina's question, is about the savings. Uh, and David Cameron did say very clearly in the uh, debate earlier on tonight, he gave a very specific example where there are lots of different government departments dealing with property across Whitehall, across the country. And actually what we see in this parliament is through uh, very careful management, Francis Moore and the cabinet officers managed to save £20 billion just in the way that we run government. That's both local uh, and national as well. And there are more savings like that. Uh, there's also in our plans £5 billion uh, more in terms of cracking down on tax uh, avoidance and evasion. And that's something that George Osborne has made a priority in the Treasury in this Parliament. Um, we talked about devolution. 
Um, and I think it's, you know, it's important when, first of all, we, we do think that people uh, know best how to run themselves. And I think we've made clear through the Silk Commission and the Welsh Assembly, if people are going to uh, spend money, then they ought to be uh, raising it and justifying what they do uh, to their electorates. But we're sitting here uh, in a Greater Manchester where actually this government hasn't just talked about devolution and giving local people power. We're actually doing it in terms of health, in terms of uh, civic powers, um, in terms of transport and investment. The whole of the Chancellor's northern powerhouse is all about giving uh, people across the but country Nikki, rebalancing, uh, rebalancing. Nikki, you got can a contradiction? I just, can, I just, can I just finish one thing? Leanne talked about the smaller parties holding the balance of power. That's what we should be talking about for the next six weeks, because I think that is incredibly frightening. If, if um, you, Jim talked about, you know, we're it's not going to do this, we're not, not going to do that for the SN. Mm. We're not going to do this, we're not going to say yes or no to the SNP. That's exactly what Alex Salmon wants. He wants the power to write the next budget. Well, who's I going to write your budget if you're not in a position to form a government, but you're the larger political party? Well, I'm not going to expect... We're, well, we're, no, you're <laughs> telling them that they're speculating and, and, and that, you know, well, it's outrageous. They're, they're, they're People are entitled it. to know what no, you're doing. No, because they are actually back with the Liberal Democrats and let them write your budget? The, Alex Salmon has made it very clear that he doesn't think that the Labour Party can win a majority, therefore they will need him, therefore no, they will have to have him propping up. But we are going to majority, and George Osborne will be writing that and budget. If you, yeah, but if you don't get a majority, you're in exactly the same position as you're saying he'll be in. So what would you do? Well, we certainly, we certainly aren't going to be going into any coalition with the SNP. No. I don't think that's no, the no, right no. thing. They don't want to go into coalition with well, you. Well, they might not want to. They might not want to. But they have, what they haven't done is they have not ruled out doing some form of a deal with the SNP. I think uh, that is, and I know from my uh, constituents in, uh, in Loughborough, that is something that is really, really alarming a lot of people up and down this country. Why does it alarm them if they've been, if they've been elected to the House of Commons and Westminster House of Commons? Why shouldn't they? Go? Well, well, the question is, what... David, is what is the price of that deal? Well, that's what, will, what will the Labour Party have yeah. to give up to the SNP? Will it be that we've got to abandon Trident? Yeah. Will it be that you've got to increase it perhaps from 1200 to 1400 <laughs> uh, pounds a month? What is a it year. that you will a year? What is it that you will have to give as a deal? And that is why we should know that now. <coughs> if you're talking about coalitions, we should this. have a, 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 all the electorate should know on the table. If you're going to join, what are the facts? What do we have to give up in order to put the Labour Party in Do you apply the same question to the Conservatives? Well, absolutely, we apply to uh, any, any. So, what any, would you want to know from them? What would I like to? to from know? the Conservatives, yes. If they were going in deals with the Liberal yeah. Democrats? Well, or maybe we're not, with we're not UK? contemplating a coalition. We're con we're no, no, no. He's not contemplating a coalition either. No, but they, they, the, 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 the SNP, I, Alex Salmon certainly is. And he, and, no, and but that's, that's Alex Salmon's matter. Go on. What's the price? What's the price of an SNP Labour coalition? I'll come to you, I'll come to you, I'll, I'll keep your hands up and I'll come to you in a moment as soon as I can. Folks, as soon the, as Jim's finished. For the Jim. next six weeks, any time you ask a Tory about the election, they're going to mention not David Cameron, but Alex Salmon. Mm. Because David Cameron can't win seats in Scotland. So someone else has the to Labour win them. The Labour Party's going to lose a lot so, of them. So Alex Salmon, he talks about Alex Salmon because David Cameron has to get someone else to win seats on his behalf in Scotland. Because any seat the SNP win in Scotland reduces the size of the Labour Party and increases the chances of David Cameron clinging on to power. It's clear. Look, Alex Salmon loves the sound of his own voice. Everyone knows that. The surprise is that the Tories want to give Alex Salmon a megaphone to amplify that voice. Okay. Because, you know, Cameron's all about divide and rule. If he can divide all the people who want him out of Downing Street, he continues to rule. Leon? So is, is that's that, is why that, we need some sort is, of change is that, is north that, and south of the border. Okay. Look, that, that's, is that the Alex Salmon you, you recognise? If there's a hen oh, parliament, yeah. it's because people don't have faith in the two main Westminster establishment parties. It, enough faith in either one of them to rule alone. And if that's the case, then it is the people that will decide that the smaller parties will have no, a role in this. No, they haven't decided that. They haven't decided yet. One doesn't follow the, the other. Parliament, the people haven't chosen the minor parties. I'm sorry, it's in, in trade. But they wouldn't have chosen be... the major ones either. No, probably. it's not. It, it, it's hardly a democracy if parties that have a, so, a tiny percentage of, vote, of the vote end up holding the balance of power. That no, will I agree, seem which is why I support STV. Under so what's the solution? What's the street STV. porter solution? I can't give the... Well, the street, <laughs> uh, the street porter solution would be... a dictatorship, obviously, with uh, yeah. me <laughs> in control. <laughs> but, Mod but it, modified, as was once said, by assassination. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is true that to people, uh, to people in England, uh, without sounding like, you know, xenophobic, people in England find all this talk of Ply Cymru and deals, they find it worrying. I mean, it is really worrying. Okay. Yeah. We find it...
We're, we're trying to project forward. We're trying to mm. see all the horse trading that's going on, and it's bothering that's people that's before they go point. and buy it. All right, let, let's hear from some members of our audience who may or may not be bothered. You. <laughs> Hi. Um, going back to the Welsh Assembly lady, if more funding was available for the smaller parties, then maybe we may have more faith in the smaller parties rather than the large parties. You mean if they had more public funding? Yeah, to... the government pays funding. For oh, they got the, more publicity. Parties, people why would go for them. They give some of their funding right. towards smaller parties. Anybody else? Is anybody worried about the SNP and the Nationalists? You were all applauding them. Go. Yes, up there. There's a finger waggling at me. You, sir. Yes. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, I think uh, what's a lot more worrying for the working people of Britain is an alliance between the Conservatives and UKIP. Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Well, clearly they don't work for the working people of Britain. They only work for the bankers and the people at the top. There is no alliance. We're working for a well, majority, majority Conservative obviously. government. Actually, one of the points that came up this evening in the debates was about people also keeping their promises. If you want a party to keep their promises, then actually they've got to be elected as a majority on that manifesto and then implement the manifesto. I think one thing that has been difficult over the course of the Parliament has been the fact that because there's been a coalition, there are things that were said on all parties uh, in the course of the last general election, but because there's been a coalition, then it's very difficult uh, to carry so some of those things out. I think you're right. I think people want a strong, definite government, and you get that with a majority government, and only the Conservatives can win sufficient numbers of seats to get that majority in six and, and would a, and would a, would a, would a, would a, would a coalition with the Liberal Democrats work again, do you think? Well, I think if that's what the, 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 the electorate obviously uh, present us with, then uh, I'm sure that we would uh, try to make that work. I work with, obviously, David Laws in the Education Department. So you'd be happy basis. with the coalition, really, again? I, I, no, I'd like a majority Conservative government. Uh, the man there in the second row from the back, you, sir. Uh, Janet Street Porter, you mentioned that um, the electorate don't vote for the minor parties, but... I think you'll find that they do, uh, but the first past the poll system. Oh yeah. The, the first past the poll system doesn't represent the views of those voters, and if we possibly had a, a proportional system, then we might end up with a fairer parliament at the end. Of okay. It. And you say over there? <laughs> yes. My worry is not that the smaller parties are getting the votes, and I think it's all well and good that nationalists are getting represented because it's what the people want. But my issue is the fact that. We're not even in government, and already all the parties are saying we refuse to work with them on principle. We've not even got it in, in a government formed, and already we're, we're in bits already. OK. Let's, let's go. We'll, we'll take another question now. We've got a question from Philip McDermott. Can I have that, please, Philip McDermott? If Greg Dyke can say <coughs> English places for English players, why is Nigel Farage castigated for saying English jobs for English workers? Yes, Greg Dyke, the Football uh, Association, said that there had to be English places for English players in the top league, in the Premier League, in order that England had a good side to play internationally. Uh, very similar to what Gordon Brown said, and he got attacked for it for saying British jobs for British workers. But, Leon Wood, what about English places for English players? Is that, is that similar to Nigel Farage being castigated for saying English jobs for English saying workers? For English. Well, I, I think that we have to recognise that um, immigration makes a contribution to the UK economy, and Plaid Cymru is not prepared to uh, go along with the whole scheme and in debate on, on immigration. So that's the first point uh, that I'd like to make. And I think that there, there are tensions, um, certainly uh, in some communities more than others, but I think that the best way to deal with tensions from... Uh, between workers is by introducing a living wage to make sure that everybody is on a decent wage and secondly to ensure that people are all able to participate in a, a trade union and I think that the breaking down of uh, trade unions over time has created a situation whereby worker can be pitted against worker, people can be exploited and the people who are most benefiting from that situation are the people who've already got plenty of money. And, and uh, as for immigration, what is your view on that? The Englishness, or the Welshness, I suppose, of jobs? <laughs> the situation in Wales uh, with regards to immigration is not the same as it is in parts of England. We've had far fewer people moving into Wales. Um, 
But that said, uh, there are still issues around unemployment, there are still issues around exploitation of workers. And if, as I've said, we address this through trade union legislation, through the living wage, through making sure that gang masters legislation is tightened up so that exploitation can't take place, then those tensions uh, would be reduced right. where they do exist. Stephen Wolf. Well, clearly there is a, a concerted attack by the political parties to try and misquote consistently the policy of UKIP. UKIP has never said that we are opposed to immigration. We have never said that we're opposed to immigrants. We have always recognised that, that immigrants who have come here for the first and second generation have contributed to this society. And by taking that on board, 76 of our parliamentary candidates are what would classify as black, mixed and ethnic. I'm a mixed race person. My grandfather's a black American. I've got an Irish uh, grandmother. I was brought up in Moss Side in a mixed race family. And 16% of our candidates standing in this parliamentary elections are those who believe in this country that it is a melting pot of a thousand vo voices that have worked well for years and years. But what we are concerned about, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Leanne, the numbers do not stack up. The OECD, the EU, and even the own government's uh, commission recently has said that when you have large-scale migration into this country in the levels that we have had, then you will always have wages pushed down for those at the lowest level. Now, you could take that from the large corporates who have the power to be able to push down wages, but it is a fact that's there and it's recognisable by all economists across the globe. And all that UKIP is saying is that for a period of five years we would have a moratorium on low-skilled and unskilled migrants coming to this country so that we could have a period of reflection on a number of areas. Firstly, to have some natural wage inflation. Secondly, if we're able to be able to do funding through government, to have the opportunity to make sure that we can build the schools where they have imbalances at the moment, so that we can look at the hospital places and put them right, so that we can look at the natural infrastructure that people don't talk about, which is our sewage or water, and to consider how we bring our communities together. Can I ask, under this moratorium then, would you then stop people from the UK living elsewhere in Europe? Because well, there are two million people from the UK who live in other parts of Europe at the moment. Would you say they all have to come home, or is it no, different rules apply for Absolutely people not. Because what you're, what you're trying to say there is what you were trying to say there is that a government in this country would have the influence and power to decide the immigration policies of other countries as well. And what we are of have said, and made it absolutely clear, I've done so here on the BBC, that those people who have come here, who were invited here from the European Union and from other countries, would have the right to remain here and work here as but well. But what about this right, then, that Nigel Farage talked about of British employers to say, we want British workers? That would preclude people who come from Poland or from... Bulgaria or from Czechoslovakia or from wherever. No, and, and again, uh, this is a very and important... And they would put people out of work in European from from countries as Leanne, well. Leanne, if I can just say... Uh, the, the very clear point that Nigel is saying is that when Gordon Brown mentioned that British jobs for British workers, in many areas he was lauded as somebody who was looking after the interests of employers in here. When Nigel Farage says it, it, it's actually totally different. This is someone who's scaremongering. All Nigel made absolutely clear and everyone ex explained that to Gordon Brown, is that you couldn't have British jobs for British workers because EU legislation, as brought into the employment laws in this country, meant that you couldn't discriminate if you wished to. And all we were saying is that the, we would consider reviewing some of those employment legislation to enable employers who have people who are British, born here, people who've been uh, repatriated here, people who'd come here and obtained British citizenship, and those who have the right to work and here, this is all... which would include those people who are already here. But this is all while, while remaining inside the EU. This is, I mean, obviously, if you leave the EU, you can do what you like. But this is while you're in the EU, you think it would be possible to change the law like this? Well, any country can actually change all, any law that they want in respect of the EU, be because they can do so, but what would happen is into the EU, they would be challenged by so the... So it's like putting up a notice, for instance, by, saying... By the Commission. No Irish, you know. Oh, don't be serious. Well, that's no, 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 well, sorry, that's, sorry, right, that's so, what it would no, be. That is not it, exactly. What am, what well, am I going to do? British jobs, what am I going to do? Workers. Turn around, my Irish grandmother couldn't do it, my black American grandfather can't. You know, this, this is a ridiculous argument in terms of that. It's what Farage who said it. What Farage, British jobs, I said, British what workers. What Farage is saying is that... We have pockets of unemployment where you have, for example, if you, if you look down in Withington or get near Mossad or Hume and you're running down there, you've got second and third generation mm -hmm. Pakistani, Bangladeshi people living there who are unemployed just as much as anybody else. And if somebody in that local community wanted to make a decision to employ them first, 
rather than somebody else, then that, that was the opportunity... That option's already open to but, them. I don't see what, what your point is, because the no, fact... No, they, they can't make uh, a discrimination, the, because... The fact the... of the matter is, any employer tends to choose the person who's going to do the job best. And the big yep. elephant in the room is that the, the, the thing you don't want to address is that young people are leaving school unemployable and in the industries where we've seen the biggest influx of immigrant workers, i.e. in catering, absolutely. leisure yes. and so on. And employers would be absolutely thrilled to employ British people if the British people were capable and of doing the job and had people skills. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm that sorry. what has to I'm sorry, if you're trying to say is... that British people here are incapable of no, working, they're... that I'm is a sort of level I'm... of arrogance that I've I'm listened to throughout arrogant. my life at university uh, and in the me, City of excuse London. Excuse me. People I've here in this country have worked hard and point. funded this country for most of its generation. Let me make my point. Let right. me make my point. And briefly, from, because I want to bring some others in. I come in from too. a working class family. I'm hardly uh, going to do them down. I have a house in the north of England. I go into a town like Harrogate, mm -hmm. where I've lived for 30 years. All the hotels in that area, the primary staff in the, that area, are from Eastern Europe. Now, I am sure that there are plenty of people who would like to take mm -hmm. those jobs. They need to be better prepared at school. <laughs> That's all I'm all saying. Right. I'm not saying that people... Okay are not okay. fit for those jobs. It's the job of the education system, and that's the gap. Well, I agree with that. Nicky, well. Nicky Morgan, <laughs> and then you, Jim. Nicky Morgan. <laughs> well, I don't agree with um, Janet that all young people are leaving uh, education not uh, employable, but I think what has been allowed to happen and what the, uh, this government has uh, tried to uh, put an end to very successfully, and we've made a commitment to full employment uh, in the next parliament uh, is that young people were allowed to leave education without having a job or training or an apprenticeship uh, to go to. That, yeah, and that's it went up to a million absolutely. young people. And that, the number of, of NEETs, those not in education employment training, has come down to an historic low. But I think what this debate demonstrates is whether you're talking about English places of English players or British jobs, British workers, it doesn't, it's a sticking plaster. It doesn't solve the underlying issue of immigration. Uh, now, uh, there is a concern in the country amongst my constituents and others uh, about the uh, levels of immigration. And I think we've heard this week that Peter Manderson has admitted that the last government sent out search parties to encourage people to come here. But one of the things I think that is great about this country is that people are able to come here, that the Bangladeshi community who live in my constituency, the Indian community, have come here, have worked, have brought their children up and are absolutely committed to this country. But, in the recent but that's poll... the point. Can I just say that the point is that people should come here and have jobs to go to. And that's why we have cracked down on the benefit system and what it is that, that draws people to here. But if people have come, they have a job, then absolutely we should welcome them. OK, you come in briefly and then come to Jim Murphy. I just want to make the point that um, we talk about immigration and obviously there's a lot of scepticism and a lot of concern, but a lot of the jobs, I know Nikki you've quoted, 1.9 million jobs were created. But a lot of those have been actually been taken up by immigrants, so I think we should also recognise the benefits that immigration brings a lot more than the scepticism that I think we've seen. The benefits of immigration. All right, and you, sir? Um, just coming back to the point about UKIP in the EU. Yes. Um, there was a report issued late last year that said that the net gain of the EU was £5 billion. Also, I think the other difference is that Greg Dyke just wants to make a decent English football team, <laughs> yeah. whereas EU provide a lot more to this country than you, making a decent if, football if, team. All right, if you look... Yeah, 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 are you get... Uh, is, is, is Greg Dyke right to have English players for English football? Um, or is no, that, is I, don't that, is so. that a... I don't think so. I think as long as you've got foreign investment into English football, I think it's about competing with the best of them in order to become okay. the best Jim, across Europe. Well, Jim, I have a Jim, Jim Murphy, here. Jim Murphy. I mean, I won't get drawn in English football players for the English team. And in Bolton, you've got a Northern Ireland manager, so I don't know how any of, uh, how any of it would work. But look, see... The, I talk, I talk and meet a lot of people, including members of my own family, who feel the pressures um, created by immigration. The fact that, on occasion, employers have undercut um, workers who were born in our country because immigrants are exploited, often by recruitment agencies, and attempts to try and undercut the national minimum wage. So, I think it's a great thing about our country that people want to come here. We should be proud and kind of patriotic that our country is so great that people want to come, but we need to have a set of rules. Of course we have. But the one group of people we shouldn't blame for the problems of our country, in my opinion, is the immigrants. No, we don't. And the fact that the pressures on health service, pressure on the schools, we need a strong immigration system based upon rules. So, for example, immigrants shouldn't get benefits within two years of coming here. We should ban those employment agencies that only recruit from overseas workers. 
But in saying all that, if there are still problems in our country, we shouldn't demonise immigration or immigrants. And Scotland, no of course, no Scotland, no Scotland requires more immigration well, there's, there's, than England, doesn't it? It came well, out are, during the debate about whether you should go independent. There are, there, are, there are pressures in Scotland yes. because it's got a higher than average older population and a younger than average... Um, smaller than average younger population. Now, that's not because Scots are less active in the bedroom department <laughs> or, any, or any of that sort of stuff. It's just, of course, that Eng England, England in the south and in the Midlands had a much higher degree of immigration. That's what's changed the working okay. age population in England. The last thing is, if you want to blame someone, don't blame the immigrants. Blame the government, blame the government. whether blame it's the government. Tory or blame Labour, government. blame the government. All right, let me bring in your, your, your new chum, Philip. Uh, you asked this question, do you have any comment on it? And then we must well, move on to another one. I'll take a point from you. The two. debate went exactly the way I thought it would, but my question was actually predicated on the fact that Greg Dyke is, what, Greg Dyke is one of the media glitterati yes. and is untouchable. Yes. Whereas Nigel Farage puts his head above the parapet and gets shot at. So you think that Greg Dyke was being was improper, was being nationalistic or was being... Or, or was let off the hook for saying what he said about the English? I actually agree with him. I think we should be, we should be encouraging. Every time we bring in a, a foreign player, it pushes down one of our just slightly underneath the radar players. So would, you, would you ban Bolton having a Northern Ireland manager? No, you may not be a Bolton fan, I, Philip, though. I am but, but David, I, I, the United I, Kingdom, after I, all. I, I, do have, I, I do have something. I, here in Bolton, my brother Nathan Wolf played for right. Bolton. Here and uh, he got his debut under Sam Allardyce when he, he put the ball across the line in the quarter-final of the UEFA Cup that nearly got us into the semi-final. So I do have some okay. kind of keen interest <laughs> on you, that. You, 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 sir. All this with discriminating against immigrants in employment, it seems to have done a complete 180. All you hear in the media these days is how there's not enough Asians in the armed forces. There's not enough black football managers. There's not enough women that are stand-up comedians. Even the police seem lately to be employing what they call positive discrimination. Whatever happens to getting a job on merit, how good you are at yeah. the job, if you can actually do the job, if you qualify to do the job. Strength reporter. Positive discrimination. Run riot. Is that what you're saying, really? Positive discrimination is not enough of it. It's, it's too much of it. Nothing's hardly. positive about discrimination. I'd love and listen, Agreed. I'd love positive discrimination to ensure that women who are half of the population of this country were adequately represented mm -hmm. in Parliament. Because at the moment, <laughs> women make the majority of decisions about spending in the households. Women have more economic clout than the men do in this country when it comes to buying and selling and spending money. Okay. And yet they're underrepresented in Parliament. Full stop. Why? All right, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've, got, we've only got five minutes left. We'll come to somebody who might have also, if he was on this panel, have had strong views about this. And have a question from James Frankel Slater, please. After a petition, uh, after a petition ex exceeding one million supporters who pay their annual television licence, how is it acceptable for the BBC to sack Jeremy Clarkson? <laughs> I don't know what... I don't know what... I don't know what... I don't know what Jeremy Clarkson's views on positive discrimination are, but Nikki, <laughs> Nikki Morgan. Because I think that when you are um, somebody like a Jeremy Clarkson, you are a public figure, actually, um, if you do something as he did, then actually there has to, you have to set an example. You know, I've got a, a seven-year-old at home who is incredibly disappointed that Top Gear has now been cancelled. He loved it. But actually, I do think that... Um, uh, I don't want to get into the, you know, what, the exact incident, but when something like that happens, actually, I think for all of us in the public eye, we have to set an example, and I think the BBC actually has taken the right uh, decision because it does set an example for, for, for the audience. But I'm, I'm sorry, because actually I think what it's undermined is a great uh, and very entertaining show. Janet? Um, I disagree that... Um television presenters have to be role models or that public figures have to be role models. I completely disagree with that. I mean, look at a model like Kate Moss was photographed uh, um, with drugs and then, you know, dropped by various model agencies and then went on the next year and earned even more money. Um, I think that the BBC has a real problem with getting rid of Jeremy Clarkson because it's cheerio to all those viewers. And as Alan Yentob said last night, on uh, Newsnight when asked about, you know, whether the BBC had a metropolitan, urban, <laughs> south-east bias. He said, oh, we do make programmes for the C2D audience. We do reach out to them. I mean, how bloody patronising was that? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Are you? Are you there? Of course, right. Yes. But no, nobody is indispensable, whether That's it's Jeremy right. Clarkson or anybody. 
Absolutely. So. Okay. All prime ministers or leaders of the opposition, Anybody. where they came in. <laughs> Leon Wood. If anyone else assaulted uh, a colleague in the workplace, they would be sacked. <laughs> so I think this is a case of uh, a bully having his comeuppance. And I was interested in a, a statement from Beck2, one of the trade unions representing uh, television production staff, and they said, bullying and harassment in the creative sector is acknowledged to be a big issue. Now, I would have thought, after everything that happened with the Jimmy Savile inquiry, then we should have learnt uh, a big lesson from this. Nobody is too big uh, for, for, for television, I think. OK, you, sir, in the middle there. And then I come to you, yes. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think that um, the fact that he's in the public eye um, doesn't necessarily it's mean he should be given special treatment. Um, um, and also, this question was brought on Question Time last week, and I, I think the, the media has a responsibility to stop talking about it and perpetuating it. We can't, we can't, we can't veto the questions <laughs> on yeah, Question you, Time. We'll be, we'll be doing our duty. But you can decide what questions are asked, though. Yeah, we'll be taking... Yeah, um, and, and we, take, we take the ones that have a lot of head of steam behind them. You sit at the back there. Would MPs like to engender the public support that Clarkson can, even when he does something wrong? Or is it because they don't have the character and charisma that he has? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, um, Jim Murphy. Um, you get I, the point. You don't I have the course, charisma. I think, it's a pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> if the BBC hadn't done this, what would that say? Yeah. Every, everybody who's in a senior position in any job in any way in the country, you can assault someone, allegedly, who's more junior than you in your workplace, and you can get away with it. How did John Prescott get away with it? Well, Remember that? <laughs> I think someone was trying to assault him at the time, wasn't it? They threw I, an egg at him. Well, I had eggs thrown at me in the summer, and I didn't... But, Jim, I didn't you look at... You point, look, you're talking point. about no, bullies. Jimmy. You're talking about bullies. Look at the last session of Parliament, uh, Prime Minister's questions. If you behave like that in the workplace, if I scream that kind of right, abuse but, but at Steve you, I'd be out. Right. Right. No, you can't, you can't. <laughs> Steve Wolf, we've got to stop. Steve Wolf, BBC rules, we have to end. <laughs> Steve, Steve Wolf, very briefly, Look, 30 seconds left. Every organisation, regardless of how big or small, have a duty of care to their staff, and so the BBC acted correctly. But actually, do any of us really think that Jeremy Clarkson is that concerned because he knows he's going to move on to a bigger job with bigger incomes and bigger money? Okay. The only people who are losing out with the millions who like that programme, including myself, I'm afraid. I am a bit of now a... Now I'll give you head. back five, I just look five at seconds, I Jim. can't afford. Five seconds. I'm just... I mean, I think he should be relieved that he's just facing the sack rather than facing a judge. Yeah, but that's sure. my own... All right. Well... Please. What? Surely it's a loss for the BBC because Jeremy Clarkson owes the, owes, owes the, uh, owns the global rights mm -hmm. for the BBC well, uh, that, for right, himself. Wait. There's also and a surprise he'll be David losing Cameron. so much money for the There's BBC. There's a surprise that, at David Cameron. There'll be so many jobs <laughs> that could be lost. Even we have to stop David, or we'll be, be cut off. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll, we'll be cut off in our prime, like... like uh, Jeremy Clarkson. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't... <laughs> Uh, I, I wasn't going to say. Uh, ne next week we're going to be in Salford and the politicians on our panel are going to hot-foot it from the spin room that's been watching the one real debate, seven party leaders, uh, which is taking place next week. Uh, so that's in Salford. The week after that we're going to be in Bristol, so if you want to come either to Salford or Bristol, there's the address to go to. You can apply either on our website address or 033-0123-9988. If you're listening on BBC Five Live, as you know, this debate goes on with uh, John Pienaar and Stephen Nolan. But here, my thanks to our panel who came here, to all of you who sat through the whole of those <laughs> two debates and then took part with such vigour in commenting on it. I'm really grateful to you. Until next Thursday from Question Time, good night. So, after tonight's first TV Leaders debate, this week looks at leadership and the lessons to be learnt from business. That follows next here on BBC One. <laughs>